So things are finally being bolted into the van and I thought this would be a good time to do a little video about how I like to do my cabinets. I'm gonna come out guns blazing and say this first thing, I don't know anyone who builds cabinets lighter than I do. I have a mild obsession with trying to keep my van conversions lightweight. Every single aspect of vanning is improved by having a lightweight conversion. You're gonna have less maintenance, better efficiency, better driving characteristics on-road and off-road. You can put more stuff in your van, carry more cargo, and if you ever need to tow, you're not worried about exceeding any kind of capacity. Every single part of the van experience is better if you have a lightweight, nice and nimble conversion. But building lightweight isn't easy. So today I would just kind of like to talk about how I build my cabinets and give my opinion on the topic. Please remember, build your van any way you like, whatever makes you happy. Um, so I hope today is maybe more of a conversation starter or some food for thought. If you're gonna build your own van, then fighting words. So before we talk about the cabinets in my van, I think it'd be good to talk about 80-20 aluminum extrusions, which I'm gonna crap on a little bit. If you look up this stuff on the internet or if you Google how to build lightweight cabinets, 80-20 aluminum extrusions will come up pretty quickly. And there's three things about them that people seem to just tout over and over. Uh, first is that it's lightweight, next that it's extremely strong, and then that it's easy to work with. So let's start with the weight aspect. In the van so far I've got these two cabinets installed. This lower one is about 35 inches wide, 27 inches tall, and 23 inches deep. On top of it, on the right part, the fridge will sit. And on the left part of it, I've got another cabinet, and that one is about 37 inches wide total, 39 inches tall on the right portion, 31 inches tall on the left, and it averages about 21 inches deep because it does get narrower towards the top due to the curvature of the wall. Now, right before I installed these cabinets, I weighed them. Uh, this bottom cabinet carcass weighs 20.70 pounds, and this top cabinet weighed 26.92 pounds. Now let's quickly talk about the weight of 8020. You can buy 8020 in different sizes. Uh, most commonly van people seem to use series 15. Um, that stuff weighs 0.1123 pounds per inch or 1.3476 pounds per linear foot. And then the other series that gets used a bit less is series 10, uh, which is a smaller extrusion and it actually weighs uh, 0.5088 pounds per foot. That said, from the reading I've done, Series 15 is easier to join together, so it just tends to be a little more popular. Now, I'm a left-handed Pollock, so I don't really rely on CAD technology too much, but I am a big fan of pad technology. So let's just quickly draw out how you'd probably frame this cabinet using 8020 and how much just that framing alone would weigh. So that lower cabinet, it's uh, the wood one I've got, is about 35 inches wide, 27 inches tall, and 35 inches front to back. It's also got the center divider so we can have drawers on both sides. So this is essentially kind of just sketching out what our aluminum 8020 framing would look like for this cabinet. As well though, in order to mount some drawer slides, if we have three drawers on the left here, we need three more members like that, and we need three members across from it for the other drawer slides. And then since we have two drawers on this side, you know, we could probably mount a drawer side to each side of this, but we need some on this side as well. Then we do need some horizontal dividers because you're probably gonna be able, wanna use some kind of latch system for your drawers in your van. So across each of these fronts, we'll have uh, essentially, I guess we'll have two dividers on this side because this top drawer will latch off of this, this drawer will latch from here, this drawer will latch from here. And then we need one more divider here for another drawer to latch here. So if we calculate that all out, we have a total of 650 linear inches of 80-20. And I know you're gonna say right now, hey idiot, there's some overlap in these corners because if this piece is an inch and a half wide, this piece is an inch and a half wide, this isn't really 23, it's gonna be a 20. That said, we are not including the weight of any of the brackets or the bolts, nuts and bolts to hold this together. So we're just gonna allow that overlap and it will probably come out to a wash. And again, this is all just an estimate. So for this lower cabinet, we've got 650 inches. And now if we look at a sketch of the upper cabinet, we can kind of repeat the same thing. Uh, 
All right, 766 inches for this upper cabinet. If we look at the weight of series 10 aluminum extrusion and series 15, as we said, series 10 is just over half a pound per foot and series 15 is 1.35 pounds per foot. We can do the math, about 63.83 feet of aluminum. And if we take this other cabinet, it equals 54.17 feet. So if we multiply that at series 10, 27.56 pounds. And with series 15, we get 72.99949 pounds or 73 pounds. And for this, that's for the lower cabinet. And if we do the same thing for this cabinet, 32.48 pounds with series 10. And with series 15, we get 86.02 pounds. And if you remember, when I weighed these cabinets right before I installed them, you would compare this to the weight of my wood cabinet, which is 20.70 pounds. And this upper cabinet is 26.92 pounds. And keep in mind, these aluminum measurements do not even include the weight of all the panels you would need to complete them so they look finished. So anyways, as you can see, 8020 aluminum, even using series 10, is considerably heavier than the cabinets I've been building. All right, after weight, the other thing that people seem to love about 8020 is how strong it is. And I can't really argue with that. You can watch these videos on the internet of people doing pull-ups off their overhead cabinets. And that is something that on many wood cabinets I wouldn't try. And especially on these lightweight ones, they're not designed for that. At times like this, I kind of think to myself, like how many times have I walked into my house and been like, man, I'd really like to do some pull-ups on my furniture or gone down to the Home Depot and been like, where should I store these sandbags? Or, oh wow, I gotta put some patio pavers in. Perhaps I can fill my kitchen drawers with them. Even me, a fairly immature adult, I do not see times when I need this kind of strength. For anything useful like clothes, food, climbing gear, hiking gear, or even like cases and cases of beer, this furniture is plenty strong. And finally, there's the simplicity aspect with 8020. I can't really touch on this and I can't disagree with it either. I think looking how these cabinets are built, it is sort of like using Lego blocks. It's really simple. Um, the only thing I would kind of say is if you are paying somebody to assemble your van for you, it's kind of like if you paid a furniture builder and you find out they went out to Ikea, you're kind of, you know, you, what are you really getting if someone is using the most basic building system possible? So that part, if you're building your own van, you maybe don't have very many tools, you're not a very experienced woodworker, you know, that can really be a benefit because you will make a nice and strong product. And finally, one of my main reasons for not liking 8020 is just how inefficient it is. And I'm not even gonna touch upon the fact that with 8020 framing, you're basically limited to right angles and making squares, which just makes it really hard to utilize all the nooks and crannies and curvature of the van. I'm just going to strictly focus on what kind of cabinet space utilization you get by using it. So let's look at this lower cabinet I've got built here. It is exactly 35 and 3 8 inches wide. And then if we measure the inside width of the two drawers, the one on the left is 13 inches wide and the one on the right is 20 and a 16th inches wide. So if we use, do the math, we essentially have 33 and a 16th of an inch of usable drawer space in a 35 and 3 8 inch wide cabinet, which means we actually get to use 93% of this width for storing stuff. However, if we draw out what this cabinet would look like made out of 8020, we would first have three sections of vertical 8020 supports, which is four and a half inches of series 15. And then assuming you're using half inch plywood for your drawers, you'd lose two more inches to that. And you're probably using drawer slides, so that's another two inches gone. So as a result, you're getting a realistic 76% utilized. Even with series 10, you're only up to about 80% that you can use. Isn't that just kind of disappointing? You just lost a quarter of your cabinet to some aluminum framing and how you've decided to build your drawer boxes. All right, so my 80-20 rant is over. So now let's look specifically at how I've built my cabinets and uh, how I can make them strong enough. 
and what kind of techniques I use. First and foremost, material selection. This can't be overstated. When I first got into woodworking and especially vans, a lot of people will say, use Baltic birch. It's way stronger. So instead of, you know, in a place where you would traditionally use a three quarter inch piece of plywood, you can now use a half inch piece of Baltic birch. But if we look at the weights of this, you're not really saving a whole lot of weight. From my local big box store, three quarter inch maple plywood weighs 1.79 pounds per square foot. If we compare that to 12 millimeter Baltic birch, it weighs 1.68 pounds per square foot. So sure, you are using a thinner material, but it's actually only saving you about 6% in like material weight, which is fairly negligible. So let's talk about some alternatives. First off, I would say just get away from Baltic birch. Half inch maple plywood is 1.14 pounds per square foot, uh, which is essentially a third less than three quarter stuff, which makes sense because it's the same product, just the third thinner. That said, my favorite plywood that I have driven across the country to get before is uh, to get some poplar core plywood. I cannot find this stuff anywhere between Salt Lake and Denver, and I live basically right in between the two. But there's several Seattle and Portland area distributors like Edensaw or Continental Hardwoods. It has a higher ply count like Baltic Birch. For the 12 millimeter stuff, it's just over a pound per square foot. Quarter inch stuff, it's 0.505 pounds per square foot. And the three mil is 0.247 pounds per square foot. In terms of vans, I essentially never use three quarter inch plywood anymore. For the sheets that I order into my shop, about 75% of them are either three mil or six mil sheets, and the other 25% is 12 millimeter sheets. I think there's just very few applications where you're going to need to use three quarter inch sheets if you understand how to stress the plywood correctly. So how can I get away with using such thin materials? Um, I think the first key is to start using wood glue for all the strength aspect of your wood joinery. Early on, you might be using screws to hold everything together, but when you're trying to join like a three millimeter and a six millimeter piece of wood, there's just no meat there for any kind of fastener to hold. So you're gonna have to use wood glue. Don't get me wrong, I use tons of brad nails to hold my cabinet together during the assembly, but for any kind of surface that you're actually gonna see, it's just clamp and weight. It is generally accepted in the woodworking world that glue, the glue is stronger than the wood. Basically always the wood fibers that are failing before the glue that fails. So the glue is extremely strong, but you need to do a few things to be able to use it well, primarily being you need to be precise. If you have a big gap in a joint you're trying to bond together, you can't just squeeze glue in it and hope it works. Wood glue does not work well for gap filling. And then using wood glue is a pain, especially if you come from the world of just like screwing things together. It is such a time suck. Not only do you have to wait for the glue to dry, but all the prep work to make sure things are gonna fit just right. You know, like once you put glue on something, you gotta go. After the glue dries, you got quite a bit of cleanup. You're gonna probably have to resand things and it is just quite the process. All right, and then the other important consideration that you've always gotta think about as you're assembling these cabinets is how can you actually stress these joints and these thin materials that you're using in a way that takes advantage of their strengths. So if you go to Wikipedia and you look up mechanical stresses, it gives this great graphic of five different forms of mechanical stress. The first two, tension and compression, plywood is great for. In fact, almost any van building material that's you know, feasible to use does great on this. You, know, you can take this plywood, you can't really compress it, and then if you try to uh, put it under tension, you, know, you would essentially have to like pry these plies apart in order to get it to expand. In this way as well, if you've ever heard a joke about a board stretcher, you know, I can't, stretch this thing apart and I can't shorten it by pressing it together. So those first two plywood is great for. Shear forces as well, plywood is fantastic for. You know, when you look at that image, we can't take this thing and manipulate it to basically become a parallelogram. It will keep this shape like this. It has great shear strength. But the last two, which would be bending and torsion, these thin materials are terrible for. You know, I can twist this as much as I want, I can bend it. And these are the two kind of ways to stress these thin materials that you want to avoid. The other thing to consider is how we are stressing our like glued up joints together. And let me just give you a quick example of this. We've got a couple of glued up corners here. And if I have the plywood in a form where it's just gonna see a lot of leverage with kind of like a big lever arm here, like it doesn't take too much strength to break these joints, right? But if I also try to use, this is essentially like position this in a way where I actually have to shear this joint off. You know, like if I just try to slide this apart in any direction, this thing is incredibly strong. Like I cannot just slide it apart. But if I have a lot of leverage, it's easy to break in. 
So let me show you how I kind of use these principles in the cabinets that I've got installed in the van. All right, so we've got a refrigerator sitting on this cabinet. This fridge is about 70 pounds, but this cabinet side is made out of uh, eighth inch plywood that I've veneered. So if we were to imagine this cabinet failing, what would most likely happen is that this wall would have to fail. However, and from a compression standpoint, as long as we can minimize those outward bending forces, the compression of this cabinet has got plenty of strength. So let's look at how this cabinet is built and how I've managed to do that. So to prevent this cabinet from having bending forces, if we remove these drawer boxes, we look at this, that we've got these runners essentially across here and across this top. And to prevent even small bends here, I've got these small extra strips of wood glued on. So effectively here, we've got the strength of like a three quarter inch piece of plywood along the edges here. So if this wall wanted to bend out, it would have to essentially, you know, break the connection at all these horizontal points. And to make sure that this bond doesn't fail, if you imagine this, I would essentially have to shear the bond between here and between here for this thing to be able to pull away. And I've got another one down here, and I've got the same thing in the back of the cabinet. And as a result, this is an extremely rigid and strong structure. And now let's take a look at this upper cabinet here. This entire left portion here is floating. You know, I'm really happy with the fit I managed to achieve here. This is one of those examples where if you were using 80-20 aluminum, like, you know, just making the step in the back that goes around the pillar, but I can push that cabinet further back to get more storage. This is a nice curved surface that just matches the door perfectly to just maximize any amount of storage you can get. But this entire left portion is floating. And the reason I feel that this is a strong bond is I've got an incredible amount of glue surface area right here. If this was to give out, if I overloaded it, it would have to shear this load along the whole thing. As well, it doesn't want to deform because each of these panels is solid. So it's essentially a big shear plate that does not want to change shape. As well, the cabinet does not, you know, if you were to load it left to right, each of these bottoms is glued in. And as a result, that's like another shear plate that is resisting this cabinet being able to warp. So it's an incredibly stiff structure if you understand how to stress this plywood. Nowhere in this cabinet do I have large areas that are susceptible to either bending or torsion forces. And as a result, this is just a very stiff and strong structure, even though it is incredibly lightweight. So finally, let me just touch on a couple other things related to these cabinets. Um, first, poplar plywood, I wouldn't say is ugly, but it is not like a finished grade plywood. It's a very boring looking, it's a very light colored wood. And at least for me locally, about any interesting looking plywood I can get, like a walnut veneer or a cherry veneer, in these thin eighth inch or quarter inch thicknesses, if I can get it, it's gonna have an MDF core. For any like regular building cabinet application like kitchen cabinets, MDF core is basically fine. You know, it is heavy, but it's extremely stable and makes just beautifully flat panels. However, in a van, MDF is a horrible choice. It's just not structurally very sound. So in about the last year, I've started playing around with veneering my own panels. If you are a woodworker, you know, building out a van, I think learning to veneer stuff is just a very fun thing to do. Um, you do have a little bit of an upfront cost to get a vacuum system put together. Um, but it just really kind of opens the door to be able to just use really cool pieces of wood, you know, and pieces of veneer that, you know, to buy a slab of like some really showy walnut could be thousands of dollars, but you could buy a really cool piece of walnut veneer for less than a hundred bucks. And then you can also just use extremely thin stock and it just makes nice, beautiful vans. But you know, in the end, it's frustrating. I've spent hours and hours veneering panels for this van. And then at the end of the day, you know, the first day out of the shop, I could go crash this thing, which is just, uh, you know, what's the point of life? <laughs> like, what am I doing with my hours of my day? And then the other thing in this van that I'm trying out relate to the drawers. The first thing is I'm building these drawers out of six millimeter plywood, and I'm using finger joints to essentially hold all the corners together. Finger joints are extremely strong. I have zero worry that the bottom of these drawer boxes will kind of give out, which is kind of the big worry with most drawer bottoms. And by being able to use six millimeter plywood, I've essentially, cut my drawer weight in half. The complication there was I couldn't really attach drawer slides to six millimeter boxes. But you know, as I've become you know, a better woodworker, I've built several pieces of furniture for my house where I just do wood slides. There's no metal drawer slide, it's just wood on wood. Um, you gotta be pretty precise with this. If you have you know, too much slop, you'll have problems with the drawer binding. And if you have too little slop, you'll have problems with the drawer binding. 
it took me a bit to get in my woodworking kind of life here to be comfortable doing this, but this van's got six millimeter drawer boxes and no drawer slides. And for perspective, all the drawers in this lower cabinet, there's five of them, weigh only 15 pounds. And I've also saved an additional 14 pounds by not using metal drawer slides. Anyways, the take home here is that building lightweight is pretty time consuming, but it's not really all that difficult. It's just really kind of becoming aware of the techniques and what you could pull off. So I hope that this video, you learned something and you found it useful. Thank you.